This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Today, we talk with speaker and author Stephanie Tate. Stephanie's book, The View from Rock Bottom, is a memoir that affirms the presence of God even in our suffering. It is a compelling and honest testimony. We discuss the book, politics and religion, and hope for the future. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be. We welcome you back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And I am Vicar number one, Rob Henderson here from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London. Joined uh, by Vicar number two here, uh, Rabbi Kevy, uh, Kevin George, St. Aidan's Church, London, Ontario. And also joined by Ian. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, editor, whiz <laughs> dental assistant <laughs> dental assistant yeah, yeah. Uh, back to the dentist right yeah. oh DD. digital deacon yeah i got so many titles he's a digital, digital deacon. deacon he's a digital uh, deacon on sundays yep so many yeah. titles wow well, today, guys, we're uh, looking forward to having a, a wonderful guest into the Vickers Crossing. We're going to be talking to uh, Stephanie Tate. Stephanie is a writer and speaker and advocate, and she'll be with us shortly. Her book is uh, called A View from Rock Bottom, God's Embrace in Our Pain. So Stephanie will be here shortly. Yeah, we look forward to having her. And I, I just got dizzy because you went really slow and then really fast. The internet's a funny thing some days. <laughs> anyway, let's do the land acknowledgement. Uh, the Vickers Crossing acknowledges that the podcasts we record today are recorded on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenawayapuk, and Attawandaran peoples on the lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse and indigenous peoples, including First Nation, Métis Inuit, who we recognize as contemporary stewards of this land and vital contributors of our society, and uh, with whom we wish to work together towards reconciliation. And uh, we're thankful, uh, getting a lot of feedback uh, from last week's guest folks, uh, Andrea Proctor, and the work that she's done with the Inuit and Innu up on uh, the coast of Labrador and in northern Newfoundland. Um, so uh, thank you, Andrea, again for doing that. Uh, let's continue to to do that work. All right. And let's uh, say again, hello, and thanks to our wonderful sponsors on the Vickers Crossing, without whose assistance we would not be able to do what we do all, uh, every week. So uh, again, thank you to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated, thanks to Dave Mullen and his staff at A. Miller George today. And we uh, do a shout out today to Carol Basada over at Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally loved, locally operated. You want to, uh, they'll help you switch your prescriptions. You don't even need to have that awkward conversation where you walk into the big Rexall or shoppers and say, can I have my prescription back? I'm moving somewhere else. You don't even need to do that. You just go in and you see Carol and you say, Carol, can I get my drugs here? And she's like, boom, where do you get them now? And she's on the phone with them and she gets your prescription and everything gets changed. So go see Carol. You'll, you won't be disappointed. And last, but certainly not least, it is my pleasure to thank Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. And Trisha Lister is a wonderful human being that hooked us up with that one. So uh, yes, many thanks to them over there. Hey, hey guys, I got something to show you. Can I do show and tell? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, for those of you who listen and can't see this, you're not watching the YouTube, I'll, I'll describe it. I have three magnets here. These magnets were sent to us by mm -hmm. our dear friend and faithful listener, Betty Fraser. Ooh. And there's one of these, ah, one of these magnets for each one of us. Ooh. And, and the magnet says, I cannot live without books. Without books. Wow. Yes. Okay, cool. And she sent one of those to and each what's of the, us. Who's the, 
that's a quote from someone, but I can't see yeah, the, it, the I signature think, on there. I think that might be Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Is is what I think. Let's have another. Wow. One. There we go. Man. Well, Betty is originally from Philly, right? That's right. So she she would know a lot about Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. So she sent us a magnet each, guys. So if we ever get to see awesome. each other again, you will get your magnet. Okay. Sweet. Good. All right. Wow. Thank you, Betty. That's cool. Thank you, Thank you very much. Cool. That's really cool. So so uh, last show we did, Ian was absent. Yeah. And Ian was absent, as we explained to our listeners, uh, because you had a little date with the dentist. Yeah. That's true. Which is never fun. Um, I had so, I had to take uh, his t- I had to take his turn in that game show thing. I know, yeah, that was that was painful. Ian. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kevin's no Ian. I know Ian. <laughs> Cheapers. I'll tell you. Um, so anyway, you were at the dentist, and uh, we we tried to get Ian to explain before we went on and did the show today exactly what happened, but mm-hmm. we're going to have to wait. But we've waited long enough, and so we're going to kind of incorporate Ian's story into everyone's favorite game show. On the Vickers Crossing, which is called. It's not a lie if you believe it. Ah, ah. Now, Rob, what is this? For those new new to the podcast, what is this? Well, this is something that we hope our listeners will embrace. Um, this idea that uh, you know, if if you tell a lie and you believe it, (laughs) it's actually not a lie. (laughs) It's true. So feel free, folks, to embrace this new reality that we've discovered, thanks to George Costanza. And uh, so Ian's going to tell a story about himself that might have something to do with the dentist, uh, and it may be true or not. Kevin and I are going to try to figure out whether he's telling the truth or not, okay? So... So th- this is a little pre 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 preamble. I was going to say mm-hmm. prerequisite, but preamble sounds like a better word. Pre- preamble might be more pre- like it. Preamble to the story is um, my dentist appointment last Tuesday was the first time I've been to the dentist in about five years. Yikes. Um, yeah, oh, it's big yikes. Yeah. Um, however, you know what you are? What? You're an anti-dentite. <laughs> <laughs> I am not an anti-dentite. <laughs> You're an anti-dentite is what you are, Ian. Um, so it's it's been a hot minute. Um, but, you know, I went to the dentist on Tuesday like a good little boy. And, um, you know, they they checked up on my teeth. Teeth are very strong. And and here's here's where the not a lie, if you believe it, comes in. Um, okay. After five years of not being to the dentist, there is nothing wrong with my teeth. Nothing. <laughs> no, nothing. Nothing at all. Hmm. They are, they are. And you're putting pristine. that out there. I guess your story. Okay. Yeah. Because his story is, is that he hasn't been to the dentist in five years and his teeth are perfect. Yeah. Like, so in other words, you had no, had to had no work done or other Nothing. than maybe a little, f- little cleaning and x-rays and they do that regular stuff. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So after marching know, around, marching think. around London, he, uh, Rob, he's been marching around London <laughs> for five years as an anti-dentite. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> refusing to go to the dentist. No, now, I wasn't refusing. It's just now he kept he getting goes, rescheduled. Well, yeah, five years. Come on, and okay. and so then, and so, so then, <laughs> so then he goes and he wants us to believe that he's got perfect teeth after five mm-hmm. years of anti-dentite behavior. I gonna I call baloney. I say that there's at least something that needs addressing in there. That's right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'm gonna give you. Um, uh, no, no. Ian's a pretty healthy dude. Okay. I don't think Ian's a, you know, bowl of Captain Crunch in the morning and um, down to the 7-Eleven for a big gulp. But I don't think he's a big sugar guy. I think he's a pretty okay. healthy guy. So okay. I'm thinking that 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 might actually be true, being a young, healthy dude that he is. So I'm going to say it's true, Ian. Well, I am a big, healthy guy. I had no fillings, no cavities. No, my teeth are very strong and clean. Yeah. But, but you need your gums trimmed. No, uh, oh. they are in the wrong spot. I need your to get either in Invisalign or, or 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 braces or something like that. Probably Invisalign. Now, like thinking about it, um, my my teeth are are um, grinding when it's like in not like in my sleep, but they they just they're not in the right spot, and I need to adjust that. They're so. not like aligned. <laughs> yeah, it's like the one side of my. Yeah. Should I ask? Should I ask which orifice they're located in if they're not in the yeah. right spot? They found four teeth in his ear, <laughs> a couple teeth. in his foot. Yes. <laughs> why do you have why you have teeth there? No, most people don't have teeth there. <laughs> yeah, um, that's good. They're just they're they're 
there's a lot of wear on my te- my teeth, okay. especially my bottom teeth. So it's it's not. But no cavities. No, no cavities, no nothing. Oh my goodness, nothing like that. Just, that's a they're just miracle. they just yeah. need to be shifted around a little bit. Okay. Well, okay. All right. Yeah. So what do they do? What are they going to put in a uh, an appliance? <laughs> You're going to have to wear an appliance. We'll yeah. have a, Sa- a Samsung refrigerator on order right now. <laughs> um no they're gonna put invisalign is like what what's gonna make my teeth all fancy schmancy again okay yeah okay. well there you go yeah. so it was kind of a half truth kevin half no, well, we'll go half. We, get a half we get a half a point each yeah we sure. didn't know that he had teeth in his toes Ooh, dairy toes. Air. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on what's going on all right all right so that's uh it's not a lie if you believe it and that's ian's half truth today Tune in next week. So folks, why don't we what sort, of, uh, uh, what, sort of, what sort of lies Rob is telling or not? Ooh. Oh, I come up with a good one. Come okay. With a good one. Let's uh, bring Stephanie in, guys. Stephanie All Tate right. is here. So uh, we're going to bring her into the Zoom room on the Vickers Crossing. Here we go. Here we go. And we are so happy to welcome Stephanie Tate into the Vickers Crossing Zoom room today from her uh, backyard in Oregon. Right, Stephanie? It's good to have you with us. Nice to be here. Looks beautiful. That looks there. like a that looks like a very happy place you're sitting in. It's very calming. Yeah, this is my nice corner. I had to turn <laughs> off the waterfall just for this. Oh yeah, or else I would have had to run to yeah, the bathroom. Yeah, we, we had a problem. Uh, and uh, so uh, I got to ask because uh, if if you uh, if you're online, if you're on Twitter or Facebook and you follow Stephanie, you will see every day incredibly beautiful flowers. So before mm-hmm. I get into the book and asking you questions, I wanted to ask: is is all from your garden? These beautiful flowers that you post every I day. Would say say 90% of it like occasionally I supplement with stuff from a local flower farm or if I'm really desperate I'll grab some filler stuff from Trader Joe's or something but like probably 90% of it it all comes from here and you're and you're producing these for people these bouquets Um, well before I was just producing them for me and then the pandemic hit and being someone who travels to public speak for a living was a great career to be in yeah Um, yeah when you travel yeah and it became just you know I was posting the flower pictures originally as an outlet like I don't know just for me and I wasn't expecting the response I got and then it just kind of took off and yeah now I'm very regularly making deliveries of bouquets and arrangements and I don't know where it'll go, but it's fun for now. It's awesome. And I saw you post it the other day. You've got people sending you money to bring bouquets to just people who need them. Right? Like it started randomly. Some person messaged and was like, I want to buy a bouquet, but I don't live near you. So how about I just send you some money and you give it to someone who needs it. Awesome. Mm. And I posted about it and like four more people showed up in my inbox. Like I want to do that too. Or they would just show up in my Venmo having already sent money. Awesome. And so now it's become a thing where I keep a ledger and people pay in. And every time someone shows up that says, I wish I could buy a bouquet, but I can't, or I see Mm-hmm. Somebody that, you know, just needs one locally or a business that needs a pick me up or whatever. You're I go right into there. the ledger of donated and I make them an arrangement. Fantastic. Cool. That's excellent. excellent. Well, you know, uh, uh, you're doing incredible work. And I, I honestly mm-hmm. looking to see those flowers every day gives me a big lift because I'm sick and tired of COVID and everything that goes with it. But seeing the flowers is like another bright part of the day. It's funny what the internet can do. It can make me angry and happy all in about an hour. That's <laughs> <laughs> <I'll laughs> for you. Yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> Listen, let's let's uh, move into a chat about uh, about the book, uh, A View from Rock Bottom, God's Embrace in Our Pain uh, is an incredible book. I sat down and 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 just read it. I couldn't stop reading it. So I read the mm-hmm. whole thing. It's uh, it's really well done, Stephanie. And I, I wept uh, and uh, my, my heart was full and I was consoled because like most people, we've all lived through difficulty and knowing that there's somebody out there who's prepared to name that and lament that uh, without having to make it all better uh, all at once is a real gift. Um, your book begins on on a high. You'd been through a season of difficulty with multiple miscarriages and difficult pregnancies and um, a decade of inexplicable health concerns, but things had shifted. When you start the book, you're writing about moving to Oregon from uh, down in California, uh, which was sort of a dream. You'd found your dream home. Um, uh, your husband, Bobby, is permitted to tell a commute from California, which is great. Uh, life feels like it's finally coming together. Uh, and then you learn uh, that uh, the job becomes a difficulty. You learn that you become pregnant. And it's in that place that you're told um, on a what feels like a routine visit that your pregnancy is not viable. 
Um, you recall in the book lying on the linoleum floor in the bathroom, um, curled up in a fetal position around the womb, you write, that had once again betrayed you with your tear streak face uncomfortably stuck to the cold linoleum floor. You cried out repeatedly in lament, I don't understand, God. I just don't understand. We'd like for you to read a little bit of that section of the book, if you will, and I'll pick up with a question on the other side. Okay. This is a little excerpt from that same part. We had taken the extraordinary leap of faith without question or delay. We'd been obedient when he asked us to leave everything we knew and head off like Abraham for a new life in a new land. We'd been faithful to share our testimony of his goodness to us. We went to church, read our Bibles, hosted community groups, and raised our children to love Jesus. We tithed faithfully, even when it hurt. We were doing everything we knew how, and yet here we were again, broken, devastated, empty-handed. It was there on my bathroom floor in a state of utter brokenness that God started to sow the seeds of healing. Amid all the uncertainty and chaos, all my broken dreams and unmet expectations, he quietly began to draw me closer to his heart. When everything else had been stripped away and I held those empty hands out to him, begging for anything I could hold on to, it was then he showed me the height, depth, and breadth of his unending love for me. In the days and weeks that followed, I began my, to bury myself in the word, hoping to find answers to why these trials seemed to be never ending. Why was there so much suffering and heartache? How could a loving God allow so much pain in the life of someone earnestly striving to serve him? How was any of this fair? Were these attacks of Satan? Or was God trying to teach me some lesson that I just wasn't grasping yet and was doomed to repeat endlessly until I could? When would we finally get past all the struggling and get back to something resembling a normal life? Almost immediately in my searching, one point became painfully clear. God was about to tear down this idea of a normal life piece by piece and replace it with an unexpected change in perspective. I had come to him seeking the reasons for my specific trials, hoping he would show me just enough details of his perfect plan to make it easier for me to understand his will. I knew where he was taking, if I knew where he was taking me and why, it would be that much easier for me to accept his plans. Little did I realize he had no intention of showing me a roadmap. No, he wanted to teach me how to trust him enough to have total peace, even when I can't make out the road ahead. He didn't want me to look for the proof of how his goodness would unfold. He wanted to show me how to see his unchanging goodness in the midst of the pain. He was teaching my heart to let go of all my most fervently held assumptions, come to him in total surrender and genuinely proclaim, if not, you are still good. Hmm. I had found my rock bottom. And instead of pulling me out of the broken pieces of my shattered expectations, the God of the universe met me there in the rubble. Inside my grief, I found the start of a deepening intimacy with God that I had never known possible. There was something sacred in the pain, as if somehow in the suffering, I was standing on holy ground, breathtakingly close to the great I am. From that holy rubble, he was building something new with passion and purpose growing from deep within the fertile ground below. God was about to replace all my carefully laid plans and great expectations with his perfect best, something so far beyond anything I ever thought I wanted and everything I never knew I needed. You, uh, I, again, like this story, your story is incredibly powerful for, uh, for those who are willing to embrace the honesty of all this in terms of life. Um, in the preface of the book, you warn readers before they get a page in <laughs> to brace themselves. You say, uh, this is not a book about a God who comes in to the rescue um, and no. to make everything all better. Um, no. You describe the book as a present tense testimony, a book which springs directly from a heart still raw with grief and a body still inflicted with very real pain and very real disease. 
uh, written not as a memoir of a journey I once had, but as letters from a woman still very much traveling through this same robe with God, a woman who's still not sure exactly how God's plans will unfold. We're going to talk about uh, some of the revelations you've had on the journey, but can you share with our readers a little bit about just how devastating and broken you felt in those moments? And at the same time, um, I don't know if relief is the right word, but 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 what it felt like to all of a sudden know that now God was present, not in some time later on, but even mm. now in the midst of this. Yeah, it feels very contradictory, right? Because for me, the most healing moment was not what I expected, right? Mm -hmm. I was waiting for years for God to show up and do some big miracle and prove like the reason I got sick, the reason I was having all the miscarriages, the reason we kept losing all our jobs or having all these, you know, struggles hit one after another. Um, because that's sort of the theology that I had inadvertently grown up in. Like we never came out and said, God will always make everything perfect for Christians but there was this sort of underlying current, right? That if you do what you're supposed to do, you may not be wealthy or, you know, private plane or any of that, but you're definitely going to have a baseline minimum of, you're not going to be homeless under a bridge, right? right? You're going to have the two kids and the picket fence and the kids that grow up and go to a Christian school and everything's sort of cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. And so when for years and years and years, you are beating your head against the wall, doing everything you're supposed to do, and that's not happening. Um, you're living in this constant tension. I feel like I almost had to split myself into two people. Mm -hmm. There was this part of me that struggled with maybe I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Maybe, like I said, maybe there's a lesson I'm not learning. And if I could just get it right, or I went through a phase where I used to read, oh God, I used to read the Old Testament story of when the prophet Nathan comes to David and is like, hey, you may think you got away with your sin, but you didn't, and your baby's going to die. <laughs> yeah, you're and gonna I used get to it. pour over that going, is there some like sin I'm forgetting that I didn't confess? Is there something I'm doing wrong? And so there was that one side. And then the other side was this incessant, never ending. Like I always joke, I thought I had to be the personal embodiment of K love radio, right? Positive, encouraging 24 <laughs> seven, Stephanie, like it's okay. Cause Jesus. <laughs> and, and again, even though we didn't say it explicitly, there was that underlying belief that like, maybe if you dropped that for a second, if you didn't hold consistent faith, it'd be your fault that it didn't work out. Right. Like you had right. to have faith because if you dropped it, well, then it doesn't count and you won't get the miracle. And those are two very different perspectives to try to hold in the same person at all times. Right. It splits you, right? Yeah. It's really hard to be a whole embodied person when you're that fractured. Yeah. But when you come to the place where you accept suffering as part of the human existence, as an unavoidable part of the human existence, it sounds when you're used to growing up in that kind of cookie cutter theology, it sounds like giving up. Mm -hmm. right? It sounds like not having hope anymore, but in reality, it was the most freeing experience because in letting go of waiting for everything to all work out, I also got to let go of that fractured tension. Right. And I also got to let go of all the shame and fear and sort of anxiety of, am I doing this wrong? Am I missing something? What am I doing? How can I fix it? Letting go of that, like, that was the most healing moment of release rather but, than loss of giving up. It's liberating, it didn't right? feel that way at all. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting to me because I was just thinking, as I was listening to you, a friend of ours who's coming on the podcast in a few weeks, John Marsh, uh, just retired from a, a 40 odd years of being a priest. He's, he likes to talk about the theology of shit happens and, uh, and that it, it, it doesn't pick who it's happening to, right? Like it no. doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't differentiate between good people and bad people and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't help but think of sitting in front of one of my more senior parishioners in a, in a uh, previous parish I was in, who, you know, had gone through the loss of his mother-in-law, who was like nearly 100, um, and then his wife, and then his health started to fail, and all these things were happening. He was a lifelong church member. And of course, you wouldn't describe the Anglican Church of Canada or the Episcopalian Church as prosperity gospel. But the point that you you point out in the book, which is right, this, infu this is infused in all of us, because mm -hmm. I would sit with him and he would say, uh, Kevin, you need to help me. 
tell me, what have I done? I go to church. I do. I say my prayers. I look at, so yeah. what have I done to deserve this? What is, why is God punishing me? That's what he was. Why is God punishing me? And I think I, that this is not the God I subscribe to, but, <laughs> but it's a very real feeling, isn't it, Stephanie? Yeah. Well, and that was one of the points I really tried to make in writing the book yeah. was that if you had asked our church growing up, if you'd use the terms prosperity gospel, we would have been like, oh no, yeah, we don't, yeah, right. you know, that's Jewel yeah. Osteen and those, yeah, you know, yeah. rich guys. And we don't no, do any of that. They're, they're so time. wrong. And yet, if you really dug into the theology, <laughs> yeah. it, it's so pervasive in white Western Christianity oh, and yeah. we just don't see it because yeah. we're looking for that. God wants to make you rich. We're looking right. for the private planes and we're not looking for, you know, for instance, right? Like how often do we hear people take things like the Proverbs out of context, mm -hmm. right? As promises of like, if you train up a child a certain way, like, yes. okay, so if you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to have good Christian kids that have good lives and they won't use drugs and they won't have sex. Like, that's not how it works though. Yes. No, that wasn't no. meant to be read that way as if no. you do X, then God gives you Y. Yeah. Really any transactional view of God Yes. Is prosperity thinking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah, perverse. And it, yeah. And perverse as well. <laughs> um, yeah. And in that same light, you know, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, you know, suffering is a difficult subject for many Christian folks. We don't like to talk about it. <laughs> we yep. don't like to look at it. I, I always point to the fact that, uh, you know, Good Friday service numbers are quite low compared to Easter Sunday. Yeah. And it's not because uh, Fridays, uh, you have to work, you get the day off. So <laughs> Like, but nobody wants to go look at Good Friday. They just want hmm. they want Easter Sunday, right? But uh, um, but anyway, you write in the book about that. Suffering is one of the universal experiences that actually ties each of us horizontally to one another, but also vertically to Christ, because each and every one of us experiences pain and disease uh, and heartache in this mortal life. And Christ Himself is not, um, you know, outside of that. As I, as I just mentioned, that's what Friday is all about, Good Friday. Um, and there's not one of us who can say we've enjoyed a life free of suffering, nor will there ever be someone who can. It's a universal unifier. And yet we get surprised by suffering. Picking up on First Peter chapter 4, you advocate for less surprise and more realistic acceptance mm. that in this broken world, suffering isn't the exception to the rule. It's the default state of being. And just quoting First Peter, um, it reads, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. Mm -hmm. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Stephanie, can you say a little bit more about this and how we've kind of been seduced? Again, we, we talked about prosperity gospel in, in its different forms, but how we've been seduced by this to expect kind of this charmed existence. I, I wrote a little bit at one point in the book on how I think when we experience tragedy is one of those times that a lot of the theology we hold that we don't realize is underneath comes out. And it's even in the things that we say, right? Like when we hear that this wonderful person in our church who's with this great life of service has cancer, you know, mm -hmm. you'll hear like, but yes. you know, she's such a good person. Or so like, unfair. It happen, it's so yeah. unfair. Yeah. And so we may think that these are just sort of throwaway phrases, but they're very revealing about mm -hmm. our underlying theology that deep down some part of us thought there was some sort of heavenly ledger of accounts <laughs> that was... Mm -hmm you know, rewarding people. Yeah. And it's interesting because again, much like my church would have said, we did not believe in the prosperity gospel. If you put it that way to someone specifically, mm -hmm. they would say, oh, of course, I don't believe that. Like, I don't think God goes around giving cancer to certain people. And yet when tragedy hits, our gut reactions are pretty telling that deep down, that is what we thought on some level. Right. Um, and yet when we read verses like that, 
it's so opposite of the way we normally react, right? Yeah. When we, we always say it's so shocking, it's so yeah. you know terrible, it's so unfair, and yet the verse is straight up saying like, don't you shouldn't be surprised. Oh. This is this is exactly this is what it. you should yeah. be expecting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 further to that, I mean, I think Jesus speaks to this a lot too, in a way. You know, it's sort of like you know, uh, it's not as though what Jesus tells those who he calls to follow that it's going to be easy. And that life is going to be charmed and, you know, and, and in terms of, I mean, you write about the Beatitudes in there as well. I mean, you know, we have this perverse idea of blessing, you know, well, I'm so blessed, you know, people say, Oh, I love your house. Well, I'm so blessed. Um, you know, it's like, it's like God, God, self. Pet just, P. Do, yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. right. I call it hobby. I call it hobby lobby theology right now. Because if <laughs> you've it. ever been yeah, in yeah. like their signs, section of home decor <laughs> yeah. it's very telling what their theology uh, is yeah, every yeah, last yeah. one of them it's is so like blessed. grateful and blessed yeah. and yeah. Like, what, and blessed. Is, yeah. what does just, this mean to you exactly yeah i just love your espalade it's so nice and the blue is so beautiful well <laughs> i'm so blessed. blessed with the espalade escalate escalate that's it yeah um you know i mean <sighs> i think that that's that's the challenge though right is that we We've got Jesus who says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed. And as you point out in the Luke version, in the Sermon on the Plain, it's woe to you with the with the beautiful house and the and the Cadillac and the, you know, on and on, right? Like, it was those so are... important to me to put that version in there <laughs> mm -hmm. because yeah. it's surprising to me how many people don't know about that version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or be like, but what about the woe to parts? And they're like, <laughs> there's, that's, yeah, there's woe to's. Blessed are, uh, blessed are. And that's, blessed, yeah. That's one yeah. version. The other yes. one has the second half of that sermon. <laughs> That's like, right. You may want to read that. And it's a very uncomfortable sort of um, realization of how we've distorted this idea of blessing um, and, mm. and really sort of look to these prosperity ideas. Picking up on that a little bit, um, you can't get away from, from the fact that this often also permeates our connections in the community and how we live as as a culture and as a community and that can't be talked about without talking about politics now i don't know if you you know this or not but us canadians spend a lot of time uh watching your politics <laughs> like sports you know that my husband's you know that my husband's canadian right oh, no i didn't know that yeah he's a canadian citizen our kids are both duallys and oh, his whole okay. family all lives in prince edward island oh Very gosh good. well see i'm from newfoundland further east than that even but okay but yeah so uh, and my wife is a dual citizen because she's American and Canadian. So yeah, so we watch it sort of like like uh, in horror. You can you can yes. tell the it's, truth. It's, it's like you watch in horror. It's like it's like you it's like UFC fighting. Actually, it's it's, just like, it's, it's really it's, interesting being married to a Canadian, right? Because I bet I get to see like my in laws are some of the most conservative people I know. Really, and yet they would look at our healthcare system and be like, we don't. We don't get we it. Don't want that yet yeah, down here. Yeah. It's assumed that if you're conservative, yeah. that you are against uh, socialized medicine. Right. And for them, like they're way more conservative than most of the Christians I know here. <laughs> and they would be like, absolutely not. Absolutely. Like, we're not going to yeah, let people die in the streets. Eh? Yeah. Like that's not yeah. a thing. That's not going to work. Well, that's exactly where I was going actually is, is this idea of, of trying to sever these attitudes from politics, right? So you write, there's simply no way to discuss big picture ideas of politics or the seemingly personal beliefs that inform our political views without affecting real human beings hmm. on the other end. And this is where, I mean, we, we watch these grand debates about things like healthcare or uh, refugees or, you know, uh, right now, uh, you know, lifting children out of poverty, as we heard in the, in the speech the other night and so on. So while it's wise to caution you, right, while it's wise to caution against letting our politics influence our faith, it's impossible to think our faith doesn't influence our politics. I, I, I could not agree more. Um, you go on to say for far, uh, far too often we buy into... Um, we buy into uh, the lie that people of faith should never be political and cries of we should stop fighting about politics and just get along. Oh, sweet. Um, and are commonly heard in our faith communities. While, we're, while we are certainly called to avoid partisanship, you write, it's impossible to avoid politics. Politics isn't simply the machinations of a small, powerful elite in Washington, D.C. Politics is ultimately the way we define what we owe to our neighbors, 
and what kind of community we have chosen to be. Politics is a way about real people, and it's always about real people. So in our desire to foster unity in the body of Christ, let us be careful not to silence those suffering in our midst because of cries of, don't take that personally. One of the heartbreaking things for me as a Canadian reading your story is realizing that the many things that you've had to face individually and as a family have come with not just a a physical cost, but a, a financial cost and a financial burden. Um, dealing with multiple health concerns, uh, your uh, Lyme disease, PTSD, uh, PTSD uh, miscarriages, like these things uh, all have an incredible emotional, physical toll. And then there's the real financial cost of healthcare. Can you share with our listeners a little of what it's been like on that journey through illness and suffering, while at the same time, uh, facing these financial barriers for your family and why these larger conversations about politics matter on such a personal level. You, you entered into that little bit. I quoted by speaking of someone who was close to you, who told you to not take it personally that, that he felt so strongly about healthcare. Maybe you could say more about that too. Essentially what happened in the interaction was that there had been a number of news pundits here and even a couple of senators <laughs> that had, used the same analogy during our ongoing health care debates at the time when they were trying to overturn uh, the existing health care law, yes, right. um, under which I would have lost my coverage. Because the only reason I have the coverage I have right now is because the law tells insurance companies that they can't exclude people like me who are extra expensive to insure. Right. Um, they used and this to do is that a, the this time. is the this is the Affordable Care Act, or as people yes. call it, Obamacare. And at the time they were trying to overturn it, one of the arguments that kept coming up, which was so dehumanizing, mm -hmm. was this analogy of, well, would you ask a car insurance company to insure mm. a car that's already been totaled in a mm. wreck? And mm. it was like, <laughs> so I'm sorry, Seriously? like, are yeah. you supposed to? drop me off at the dump and like <laughs> stick me in the crusher for recycling. Like I'm yeah. a person. Mm -hmm. And so what had happened was I was in a Bible study setting and somebody repeated this argument and I was very upset and mm -hmm. expressed that like who they're talking about is me. Right. And their response had been like, well, you're taking it too personally. Like, I'm not talking about you. Like, Damn right. I don't mean you. I mean, in general, like, you know, we're talking about big picture. It's, it's just politics. Like you, sh you can't take everything personally. Um, and I was more just frustrated with this grander idea that I hear all the time, right. Of like, let's stay out of politics or let's leave politics out of it. Or why can't we just agree to disagree on these political things? Why do you have to try and shame us or blame us or, you know, use mm. the Bible to make us feel bad. We should all just focus on unity and agree to disagree on stuff. And you're right that the fact that we were going through all of these struggles and had that compound by the compounded by the financial component was probably part of why this was so much easier for me to have a light bulb moment and see. Because the reality is that I'm white and I'm squarely middle class. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have a lot of intersecting layers of privilege. But the reason that all of this was so glaringly off to me is because we were doing all the right things and yet we still couldn't make it because our healthcare costs were outpacing our mortgage regularly mm -hmm. yeah. and so the disconnect was there of like all of the things I kept hearing from people around me of like just do what you're supposed to do and make good choices and Dave Ramsey your way you know into <laughs> yeah. you know financial security it didn't play out for families like ours and when I would try to bring that up the idea was well now you're making it too personal like we don't mean you we mean in general for most people yeah. and it was hard to get people to understand that there is no for most people there is no in general there is no those people every one of these issues that you go to discuss is people like me it mm -hmm. is individual stories where majority of the time when you sit down and you hear who these people are and how they actually got where they are um, you'd be inclined to tell every one of them. Well, obviously don't, we don't mean we you, don't, we, like we you're mean. one of the good mm -hmm. ones. You're yeah. not who this yeah. was intended to hurt. We no. heard it time and time again through the Trump administration, right? Like stories uh, would come up of this person deported or that person deported and they would go, oh, well, we didn't mean those people. We meant, no, no. you know, yeah, we didn't those mean other you. people that, yeah, 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 it was supposed yeah. to be those. I'm like, yeah. no, the stories you're hearing of these individuals that you find heartbreaking, 
this is the norm. This, mm -hmm. every one of these issues is made up of individual stories, which is part of why our stories are so powerful, right? It's, it's theology with skin put on. Right. <laughs> it's, there's, there's theology in telling your story because there's a reason God came down and put on flesh and came incarnate and walked around among us instead of just having some plan of salvation that he could pull all the dials from up <laughs> yeah, there yeah. because it matters. And if we don't start talking about who these individuals are, we're not doing theology with skin in the game, right. which means we're missing the point. We're missing right. the point of all of it. Right. Well, it's pretty cheap and, and like, I mean, I, I just, that, that whole analogy of a car wreck, like, come on. I, 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 I remember years ago being in Michigan, visiting with some of my wife's family and, and hearing them talk about the deductible on their health insurance and being a Canadian going, what, wait, now what? <laughs> Cause again, it sounds like a, an automobile. What are you talking about? Your deductible? Like what they said, well, you know, like for the first 5,000, we, we pay out of pocket. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? So you get a cold or a fever or you break an arm. Oh no, we just pay out of pocket. Cause once we get to 5,000, the insurance cuts in all beyond me because mm. God's beloved, uh, you are God's beloved and God's beloved people deserve better than that. That, that is just, uh, anyway, I digress. <laughs> Don't get on that soapbox. Not brother. at all. I could do that one all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stephanie, I wanted to hold up, uh, 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 one of the quotes from the book that I just really was, um, touched me because it's about a pastor and I'm a pastor and Kevin's a pastor. And um, you, you talk about in the book about um, diversity in the body of Christ. And I want to share this part with, with our listeners today. Imagine if you will, your pastor introducing a member who is chronically ill and disabled, cannot afford to tithe much of anything, is unable to serve in any volunteer positions and relies heavily on the benevolence fund to keep up on her medical bills at living expenses. Picture your pastor lovingly wrapping his arm around this woman as he says, she is absolutely indispensable to this church. We just couldn't be whole without her. Mm. Man, that just stopped me for a few seconds oh, after yeah. I read that. Yeah. This is such a powerful reminder of the importance of every member of the body of Christ to be, to be whole, right? Um, we are given a pretty steady diet of, of uh, media and books and even theologies that affirm the importance of being um, of independence. And in writing about the body of Christ and about diversity, you emphasize the need for interdependence. So I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit more about this with our listeners. So I'm sure most people who've been in church for any large part of their life have heard sermons on that you know, we are the body of Christ and mm -hmm. some people are arms and some people are legs. And <laughs> however, I feel like majority of the sermons have really misrepresented what the passage says, right? I feel like I've heard the version that's very, um, you know, unity in the body of Christ is super important. And so um, let's not focus on our differences. Like, mm -hmm. you know, let's ignore the fact that some people are arms and some people are legs and like, hey, we're both appendages and we have that in common. <laughs> See, look, we found something in common. That's great. We are the church of appendages. Let's just be appendages and not divide ourselves, right? I've heard that sermon many times. Or, you know, we've heard a lot of, maybe not in the sermon, but we've heard a lot of like, we're a church that really prefers more eyes. And luckily there's room in the body of Christ for everyone. So there's a church for legs down the road. Right, and right. you know, there's the, <laughs> the ear people yeah. are over there. Like heard that version. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've also heard this very ableist construct around it. Right. Of like, but what's your role? Are you an arm? Are you a leg? Like what part are you playing? What are you doing for the church? You know, your, your membership should be based sort of on what are you doing? How are you serving? Mm -hmm. What's, right. what are you doing? Doing being the emphasis. Doing. Producing. And yet when you read the passage that all of that illustration comes from, he goes out of his way to talk about, like essentially he's writing to a church that's having a unity issue. And instead of saying, focus on what you have in common, he specifically writes to them about their differences. Mm -hmm. which is so backwards of how we preach this or talk about it in white Western churches. Yeah. So the opposite, but he doesn't stop there. He goes on on this whole seeming tangent for like half of it about the weaker parts 
are indispensable. The parts that we think are more shameful or whatever, we give more importance to, we cover them more, we protect them with modesty because they're important. So the parts that people do, wouldn't want to be if we were getting assigned parts are the most important um, to the whole group. And that without them, you can't have unity, which I've never really heard a sermon on that part. And mm -hmm. that's what stuck out to me is that when we give testimonies in the church, we're so used to hearing, um, here's all the bad things that I did way back when, or the horrible thing that happened to me, but then Jesus, and now everything's better. Yay. Glory to God. But I don't see churches doing a really good job at what I call present tense testimonies, right? Like, here's what I'm going through right now. It doesn't have a bow on it. it it's not a cookie cutter story. It's not a 30 minute sitcom where Danny Tanner comes in at the end and sits on the bed and explains everything and everyone's happy 30, and it's a package and it's seconds, over. Yeah. <laughs> and next week we'll be completely yeah. disconnected from this, right? Because this is solved, done. That 30 minutes is over, right? Remember back in the day, yeah. you could watch sitcoms out of order because it didn't matter. Didn't there matter. was no cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. There was no connection. They were nice little bite-sized chunks. And once you've learned that lesson, yeah. that lesson's over and you never have to go back to it. Right. But I don't, that's not really how it plays out in life. No. And I don't see churches doing a very good job making space for testimonies that say, here's this thing that we're going through. It's really hard. Uh, I don't have a miracle. We didn't get our miracle baby. We don't have our miracle healing. We didn't mm -hmm save our marriage we didn't whatever but we're still sharing this and we're here and god is still good and we're still seeking community in this and we don't have to know how it's going to work out we don't have to wait and see how like the explanation plays out before we can share it with everybody like here's our right now present tense testimony so that we can not only show that we're still here right mm -hmm. we're still holding on we still have faith god is still a part of our life but also so that you can have community back with us as members of this church. Mm -hmm. And so that other people who don't have the miracle baby or the magic healing don't feel alone or silenced or in the corner going, well, I can't really fully be a part of this church until I have that too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's a connection in making, mm -hmm. being the first one, right. To step up and say, yeah. I don't have that yet. Here's my present tense testimony. So there's room for you too. Right. I lack, I lack value. Right. So I see that everybody, and we, and we elevate people, right. We talk about mm -hmm. being the hands and feet of Jesus. So we, you know, look at these people who do this and that. We don't talk about the coccyx or the appendix or the gallbladder or, you know, or, or, or the members of the body that um, are just there. And maybe that's all they can be is just there. And there's, and, and that's as much as they can muster today. And so it's what makes that quote so powerful. I shared it on Facebook and Twitter, as you know, and I share a lot of stuff on Facebook and Twitter, but I have to tell you the uptake on that was really big. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody read those words of yours, Stephanie, and we're like, Whoa, mm -hmm. that sort of hits us right where we need to be uh, reminded of what I Jesus think the said. challenge for that one. And I want people to get is that it's not enough to have space for the people that are just there. Tell right. You. What Paul's actually saying is that the church can't be whole and right. it can't have unity yeah. without them. Right. So it's not yeah. just like we won't push you out the door if you're not actively seeking out diversity. And I don't just mean racial diversity, no, right? Yeah. I mean, class diversity and disability and yeah. people who have different faith stories and different walks that yeah. don't all have the same sort of faith that you do, mm -hmm. yeah. then the church can't actually be whole. So it's not enough to not push those people out when they come. We have to actively be seeking out creating space for that sort of diversity and bringing them in. The eye-opening word for me is indispensable. Like it's that these folks are indispensable. Um, and that's directly from the passage. I, that right. was just a quote. Right. Like that's the thing is it's indispensable. It's not tolerating or welcoming or any of these fancy little things we like to talk about in church land, but it's this, this person is indispensable, not, not just some afterthought. And that to me is the part that just really opens, opens up so much. Um, over to Ian. Yeah. I wanted to talk about your son. Um, just just briefly, because you share about your son um, in the book and your son is autistic um, and you share about a time when he was about six um, and he prayed during bedtime asking God to please take away my autism so I can just be like everybody else, which is heartbreaking. Um, he had become painfully aware that he was different than other kids in many ways. 
Um, what did you say to him after hearing that prayer and, and what was sort of the, the fallout, I guess, after that, that um, sentence? So this is on that same topic of the indispensable idea, right? Mm -hmm. That I've come to this understanding after looking at it scripturally that what Paul is saying is not just, like we said, not just tolerating, but that, like, how many times do we have churches where we hear, like, yes, but how can we see uh, unity in the midst of, like, so many differences or, or, you know, well, we have a very diverse church, so that makes it harder. And in reality, what the Bible teaches is that you can't have uniformity or you can't have unity if you have uniformity, right? Mm -hmm. You can't have unity if you have homogeny, which again is so backwards <laughs> of how we approach it in white Western churches. Mm -hmm. But he's saying that without diversity, there isn't a way to actually have true unity because you're missing indispensable chunks of the body. So when Aiden came at and he was very little at the time so before you go wow that was cheesy he was a very very little kid and i had to think very fast here and come up with a way to explain this in childlike terms but i came up with a little story for him um about a puzzle piece right mm -hmm. and this puzzle piece was brown and angular and squiggly and it looked at all the other puzzle pieces around it and they were blue and they had white puffy clouds on them. And, you know, and this puzzle piece felt like I am ugly. Like I want to be like all those blue puzzle pieces over there. Yes. The irony is intentional, but this is about blue puzzle pieces. Stay with me. <laughs> uh, and so in the end of this cheesy, cheesy story, you know, the puzzle gets put together and the brown angular squiggly one turns out to be, yes, everyone grown the face of Jesus in the puzzle. Mm -hmm. But the point I was trying to make to him is that if we all want to be alike, that we're not going to get a complete picture of the image of God, mm -hmm. because saying that we're all made in God's image does not mean we're all acceptable or it's all okay. Each of us has some component that's kind of like God. I think what it really means is that it takes all of us, the diversity of men, women, non-binary people, you know, black, white, different cultures, different classes, different abilities, different neurotypes to fully reflect the giant multifaceted beyond our comprehension God that we were created to, to, to image. Mm. And that if we change who we were created to be, if we try to be more like other people, it's not just that we crush everything together and we have that homogeny. It's also that we've basically deleted some component of the image of God, right? From the testimony that we're giving other people. There's some part of who God is that we wouldn't see because right. you're not out there being you. Right. If we didn't have autistic people on this planet anymore, there are things about the nature of God that we wouldn't see modeled to us because right. they're carrying that piece of his image. And that's hard to explain in theology to a, you know, like four-year-old. <laughs> but I did the best I could with the puzzle piece story. <laughs> well, I think it was incredible. And again, a uh, uh, shout out here to um, Elsbeth Dobman, uh, who has been a guest on this podcast. Elsbeth is uh, local here, Stephanie. She's an adult who lives with autism. And she actually is the creative energy behind the logo for the Vickers Crossing. Uh, oh. She's the artist who designed our logo. So, um, and I know that uh, uh, she will look forward to hearing you talk about Aiden and uh and that story because i think it's it's again it's that notion that there is no invaluable part that there you know that all of us are are beloved in the eyes of god and that's not just a cheesy thing it's a it's a reality of knowing that even uh in our brokenness whatever that might be um now i i would want to address that a little bit because in these um, you, you want to, you seem to, in the book, address these unending comments that we hear from well-meaning Christians about God doesn't send you more than you can handle, mm -hmm. or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus has a plan, and we'll all know it someday in the by and by, and, uh, you know, God has another angel when someone dies, oh, good Lord, help me, um, you know, um, you, you write, God doesn't send sin, destruction, disease, or death into our lives, but in a profoundly beautiful mystery, God somehow takes even the things meant for our harm and uses them for good. 
the ultimate example, you write, of swords turned into plowshares. Mm -hmm. The key to experiencing this redemptive power is to turn our pain outward, converting our laments of why me, God, into prayers of use me, God. This is in no way a justification of our suffering or a way to condone very real harm done to victims or abuse uh, of abuse or injustice, but rather a pathway to find uh, healing through this glorious redemption of our pain. I absolutely love that. I, I you know, uh, I don't I know. What, I'm, I'm sure Rob can testify to the same thing as a pastor, too, that some of the most profound examples of people journeying through loss and pain have been those who've uh, managed to do exactly what you're talking about here, which is turn the question from why me to why not me or how do I use this or what can I do with this? I know my own family included. Uh, I, I've, I've watched uh, as my, my nephew and niece buried two children, uh, twin girls, uh, and, and going through that, I, I watched the family they didn't spend a lot of time saying why me, uh, but they did an incredible amount of good coming out of that and use, allowing God to use them uh, for, for good things as well. So I wonder if you can say more about that, about um, how God doesn't send disease and, and give us more than we can bear. And, 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 uh, you know, if God brought you to it, God will bring you through it um, and all of that stuff. Um, but how God has the power to transform even the greatest suffering. This was the hardest part of writing this book mm. is that because we've gotten very used to this cookie cutter theology, uh, things get very polarized very easily. Mm. And so what tends to happen is there are people out there that are already saying and writing and preaching that, um, you know, don't sit around and wait for the miracle. You're not promised that like suffering is part of the Christian life, et cetera. That part is out there. But what often happens is it's the complete other polarized side where you get uh the john piper version right like mm. yes god ordained for all these bad things to happen to you yes. to teach you things or to God, like and that side of the spectrum i think is just as harmful oh. as well you just haven't had your miracle yet keep waiting <laughs> like they're mm. equally harmful yeah. so what was difficult about writing a book like this is if you get people in the first half that are like, yes, I'm not promised the miracle every time I'm with you. Like, I'm so tired of that sort of everything choose joy theology. They often are expecting then that we're supposed to jump on board with, so tell me why God makes the bad things happen to us right. or a different sort of false positivity, right? Where now I'm supposed to thank God that my babies died. Right. Or thank God that I got cancer, right? Because right. I'm sure it's part of his plan and he used it for his good or whatever. Yeah. And so it was really important to me to get in deep on a chapter and try to point out that I'm a firm believer that a lot of the most sacred things exist in tension. Mm -hmm. Because like we said, we have this huge multifaceted God. He's so bigger and so much outside of what we can understand in our tiny human comprehension that a lot of things that are true about God and a lot of things that are true about life as a result are both ands rather than either ors. Right. And to us, that feels contradictory. It mm -hmm. feels like holding two conflicting things at the same time that can't both be true. And yet in God, they are because mm -hmm. he's just that big. And this is one of them. And one of the hardest ones I think for us to get our hat around is when I say that we can find purpose in our pain, that doesn't mean the reason for our pain, uh, right? right? When I say that God can use these things, it doesn't mean that God sent these things. Mm -hmm. That's just toxic and gross and we should not be going there. Mm -hmm. And so just as much as this was not a book about, you know, here's my miracle story and how it all worked out because I had enough faith. It also, I wanted to be very clear, could not be a book of here's why all the bad things happened to me. And now I've given you a reason for pain and suffering in this life. <laughs> so yay. Right. There's this tension in the middle of learning to accept that I don't think God wanted my babies to die. I don't think God wanted me to be a victim of sexual assault or early childhood trauma. I don't think God made these things happen. And it would be a really flawed theology, by the way, to say that he was what, like making people hurt other people. Like mm. that's, that's, you've got a theological issue there right off the yeah. bat. But I also wasn't comfortable sinking all the way into cynicism and saying, 
you know, then all of this is from Satan. All of it is meaningless. This life on earth is just temporary. I can't wait to go to heaven and not have any of this anymore. The end, because that's not healthy either. And so one of the things I did in the book is I talked a lot about how I think Jewish theology does a better job than we do at this. Right. Uh, And I didn't even get to get into the way that it's not even just their practices around lament and grief and sitting Shiva and the things I talked about in the book in general, Jewish theology really approaches these sort of topics differently. Right. As opposed to here's a concept and here's a concept and we're going to debate it out and figure out who's right so we can all get on the same page. Jewish theology goes, here's one view on this and here's one view on this. And so now we know two views on that. That was great. Mm. And that's it. They and they just hold both of them in tension together at the same yeah, time. Hold both. Yeah. And, and, and that's and regular religious practice for them. Is that you don't right. debate each other to figure out who's right. You just go, right. oh, okay. So one scholar looked at it this way and one scholar looked at it this way and I mean, we're not God and we're not in heaven and we don't have the sight to know for sure who's right. So I may have a side that I lean more heavily on, but we're just going to have space for both of them equally. Yay. This was a great talk. Read the Psalms. I mean, right? you, you'll find it in one Psalm, let alone in the Psalms. You'll find both, both in one Psalm. <laughs> it's yeah. just so, you know, and, and an ability to lament, to give praise and to ask petition all in one Psalm. Right. And I think it's important that I was very specific like we're having these conversations and we're pulling stuff out of the book in different contexts and the book is written in a very specific order right because there is a very specific order that these things need to go in right we can't jump because we we do this we like we said we want to skip good friday and we want to skip holy saturday is my big thing right the day where they didn't know if he was coming back they thought it was all over We like to skip that part and just go right to, this is how it's all going to work out. And this is no exception. We read and hear conversations like this one, and it's easy to want to jump to the end. So we don't get to like, for example, look at people who are going through cancer or who tell Mm -hmm. us that they've been abused and go, okay, but don't be bitter. What are you going to do with that? Like, what are you learning? What is God doing? And you're like, that's, we don't get to jump to that. There are a whole pile of steps that come before that. Mm -hmm. And the whole reason in that chapter that I was able to talk about how to turn our grief outward for good is specifically because I pointed out in the whole first half of the chapter that Jewish culture has already laid the groundwork of the community holding that person, right? Mm -hmm. Before the sitting Shiva person is told, don't shave, don't take care of yourself, don't sit and think about yourself. They're already told you don't have to cook your own meals. You don't have to invite people over your front doors open and they're literally walking in. You don't have to remind people of your grief because you're dressed a certain way. And so they're reminded to take care of you. Like the groundwork was already laid for the community care part. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be very clear that there's no component of this conversation that we get to take out of context and direct at someone else. Right. These are steps that we go through to learn how to process our own grief and suffering, not how to tell other people how they're supposed to deal with theirs. Right. No, I agree. Right. And I yeah. think, I think what makes the writing and this chapter is, is so critical in it. Um, what makes it so uh, important is that it really does emphasize the need for our communities to be intentional about these things. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, we, we can't get to the, you know, let me hold you in that tension without giving people the reassurance and, and fostering communities um, of, uh, of discipleship in such a way that people know they can be safe and that they don't have to be all that and they don't need right. to do, a, you know, like those things are so very important in the midst of all this. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, Stephanie, I want to just ask one more thing before we let you go today. You know, we've referenced it in, in a few ways today. Um, you know, the life following in the way of Jesus is not easy. Um, there are challenges here, and we have all come to learn that it will require faithfulness. And, and that faithfulness really requires a willingness to grapple uh, and to wrestle with the difficulties of life and, and grapple and wrestle with God. Um, and something you write, I wanted to share with everyone. Um, you write, the most sacred truths are found in the most uncomfortable places, <laughs> and the theology of suffering can be no exception. We're called to something much more difficult than the assumption that we fully understand and thereby accept our pain. We're called to embrace the holy unease of recognizing that we serve a God beyond our human comprehension, mm-hmm. whose ways simply cannot be easily explained by our limited understanding. 
we're asked to keep questioning, to keep wrestling, to keep coming back to pray for the impossible, even as we acknowledge that we aren't promised the answers in this life. And more importantly, we're asked to remain cognizant of the very real possibility that we're getting some of this wrong, <laughs> that we don't understand nearly as much as we'd like to think, and that there will inevitably be times that, as uh, Paul says to the church in Rome, we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Mm. Um, we serve a God beyond human comprehension, as you say. We are indeed asked to keep questioning and keep wrestling and keep coming back. Um, so I guess one of my final questions is, how are you doing with that now? Uh, we know that even as you were writing the book, you were faced with loss and grief. Um, and we began by saying this is a conversation about someone still very much on, on her journey. Uh, how are you doing in the midst of, of that journey today? Depends on what day you ask me that question. <laughs> um, I wrote that part because when I turned in, um, when you write nonfiction, right, when you sign your publishing deal, your book's not written yet. Mm. You usually have an outline, you know, it's very laid out, mm. you know, exactly where you're going, all your research is done. These are the verses I'm going to talk about. This is what each chapter is going to say, but it's actually not written. Right. Um, and when I went to turn in my manuscript, I had written the chapters that I had talked about on the outline, and I felt like there was something missing. Mm. And I wanted to add one more chapter. And so I did something that I'll be very honest, when I turned it in, I was about 85% sure that my publisher was going to go, whatever this last chapter is, no, like oh. that's out. Like, <laughs> okay. because if you read the book, right, yes. it feels like we're coming to a very, like, I don't want to say comfortable, but we've definitely come to a place where mm -hmm. some of these things are nuanced, but we've circled the plane like we've we've circled the runway we're landing the plane you could mm -hmm. very clearly articulate this is her point of view on suffering on healing on miracles like there it is and so i wrote a final chapter that blows all of it up and then <laughs> goes back to the very beginning yeah. and then seemingly says the exact opposite of everything i just said and then just leaves you with this story uh and i was pretty sure my publisher was going to go no people are not going to get that you you wrecked it like just take that out leave it mm -hmm. clear leave it articulate, don't confuse mm -hmm. them. But that's not how suffering and miracles and healing, these are big things, right? If yeah. I give you a cookie cutter answer, like we said earlier, I don't wanna go to the other side of the spectrum. I don't wanna right. be John Piper and say, and now here's the reason bad things happen, the right. end, you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. No. And so for me, that struggle comes in the form of, I have a lot of opinions on faith healing because <laughs> it's usually done in ways that are really ableist and really harmful mm -hmm. and they're just bad theology, but there's a long history of harm to disabled people in the church around this. Yes. And so yeah. I came into this with very strong opinions about faith healing. And I made that clear early on in the book. Right. And yet the final chapter is a story of me feeling called to go up and ask for a miracle healing at a service where that's what they were doing. And it made me super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, as was clear by some of my shaking and tremoring during this call, I did not get miracle healing when I was called to go up there. That's not mm -hmm. the end of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like that story was almost a Rorschach test for people as they finished the book, right? right. Like, You've read this whole thing. Let's see if you really got it. Because you if you it? read this story and in your heart, you're going, oh, I know what happened. She gets healed because now that she's learned the, <laughs> the lesson, now she gets healed at the end. Then you need to go back and read You've the book You've not been again. reading the book. <laughs> right? <laughs> but right, also, yeah. if you read this book and you got to the end and you thought, wait, you actually went up and prayed the prayer? Like you actually went like, Mm -hmm. what the heck? Like, that's so stupid. You know that that's not a thing and that you won't like, you also didn't actually get the book, go back and read right. it again, because right. the truth here is in the middle that I'm not promised the miracle, but that doesn't let me off the hook for asking for it. Right. And for me, the struggle every day now leans far less on the side of K love Stephanie, who's sitting and waiting for her miracle and mm -hmm. far more on the side of, I think I spiritualized cynicism for a while. Mm 
right? Mm -hmm. That I felt like I was really spiritually mature because I didn't ask God for things anymore because I just knew he wasn't going to give them to me. And look how mature I am that I don't, Uh I don't do that. (laughs) I've accepted my suffering. Isn't (laughs) that great? Like I'm so great. And I realized, and I'm still realizing again and again, how many times it's not acceptance, it's cynicism. Mm-hmm. because it's easier to just assume it won't happen and stop asking yeah. as opposed to consistently putting myself out there again and again and right. again. But if we're not doing that, we're not really in relationship with God anymore. Right. right. If I take this component of my life and say, it's decided it's never going to work out. That's what it is. And I just keep my, my desire to not have to deal with some of these challenges to myself Mm -hmm. and I leave God out of that conversation, that's less relationship that I'm having with him. And Mm -hmm. that's not spiritual maturity. That's just cynicism. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's, you know, I waver back and forth. Uh, I lean more to the temptation of the cynicism side, but there are still times that, you know, I lean more to the side of maybe just maybe. Maybe. I published right. a book about suffering. Maybe I'll finally get my miracle. Like, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. I swing, I go back oh, and yeah. forth and I'm constantly yeah. having to remind myself to rebalance on the tightrope, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Stephanie Tate is our guest today on the Vickers Crossing. The book is titled The View from Rock Bottom, God's Embrace in Our Pain. Stephanie, thank you for your time today, for your, your gift of this book, for your witness, for your honesty and for opening up a conversation that I hope our listeners will really delve into and, and bring into their parish life and into their, their uh, Christian groups. And this is because this is the stuff we got to get into and we can't just leave it sitting on the side. It's, it's important and it's, uh, um, we have to talk about it. So thank you for, for opening that up for us today. Now remind folks to uh, take a look at our webpage under books, 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 uh, because uh, there's a direct link there on where you can order and get the book mm-hmm. um, and uh, or call your local bookseller and ask them, can they bring it in for you if they don't already have it? Uh, but as we know, many of us journey through many things. And uh, uh, Stephanie, I have to say that uh, reading about your own journey and the honest uh, ways you with so much dignity. Uh, write about your own story, your own belovedness, and the belovedness of all those who struggle was an inspiration. So, so grateful to you for taking time to be with us today from Oregon. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And again, thanks to Stephanie for her time today. We hope our uh, listeners will will, uh, read that wonderful offering of hers. And as Kevin said, check it out on the website, along with all the other books, 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 and authors, authors, authors that we've been able to chat with. Uh, thevickerscrossing.com. Check us out there and find out more. All right, guys, that's great. I want to say thanks to our uh, sponsors today again, to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated, to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, and to Molly Made, make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Made London today. That's a wrap, boys. Thanks great so much. Great day, boys. Uh, oh, next. Yeah. Come back and join us next week, folks, when we'll be talking to the great Shane Claiborne. Don't want to miss that. Okay. And I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London. Kevin George from St. Aidan's. And my name is Ian. And this is the Vickers Crossing, and we are done for the day. And Kevin, remember to always look both ways. Before you cross the street. Oh, yeah. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks! Thanks!